Okay, so today is an exciting occasion. We're finishing the book, the book of the Torah, the book of Numbers. In some ways, it is the conclusion of all of the Torah, because as we know, the fifth book is actually a repetition. So it's Moses repeating that which um, occurred in the last 40 years. But if you want to think about the actual story of the Torah, um, we, we got, we, the, the book has been concluded. In other words, if you think about the history, where does the Torah end? The Torah ends when the Jewish people are at the Jordan River about to cross into the land of Israel. That's when the plot ends. The plot then picks up in the next book of the Bible, which is the book of Joshua, which opens up after Moshe's passing. So we are now reading the conclusion of the fourth book and the fifth book, next week we'll read Fifth book covers the last 37 days of Moses' life. And he got, gave a 37-day speech. Well, I don't know if he spoke all 37 days, but over the 37 days, he repeated the entire Torah and explained it as we will discuss in the past. All I'm trying, as we will discuss next week. All I'm trying to say is that in some ways we're the conclusion. And because we're the conclusion of the Torah, you also have, uh, as we will see, the second parsha is Masse, we recount the journeys, the, 40 journey, the 42 journeys that the Jewish people traveled in the desert. And we also have all the, the specific laws that are discussed in this parsha also have to be understood in the context of um, the approach we're about to approach the land of Israel. And of course, it also, it also affects the episodes that we will discuss in these two parshas. So the two parshas together are relatively long, a lot of details. But read the portion in a nutshell, and then we will see what we want to focus on um, by, I guess, by democratic decision. If anybody has any preference, <laughs> you could just share, and then we'll try to focus on that. So here we go. I'll try to share the screen. <clears throat> so this is Matot and Masse. This is the last two portions of the book of Numbers. So as is our custom, as is the custom in the synagogue, when we conclude the book, we have a special statement, chazak, chazak, we need chazak, be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened, which we'll say at the conclusion of the class. But in any case, Moses conveys the laws govern, governing the annulment of vows to the heads of the tribes of Israel. So that's the first, the first, the first um, subject of the Torah, wars of the Parsha, war is waged against Midian for their role in plotting the moral, <clears throat> the moral destruction of Israel. And the Torah gives a detailed account of the war, the war spoils, and how they were allocated among the people, the warriors, the Levites, and the high priests. So this is a continuation to last week. Last week we read both Pinchas and Balak, we read, read about the Jewish people uh, strayed after the daughters of Moab, but now we know it's also the daughters of Midian. And now sort of is the war to avenge the spiritual, um, how do I say this, the, the, the moral destruction. So we avenge, we go to war against Midian. Why don't we go against war against Moab? They are cousins, we can't. We go to war against Midian and the Torah spends a lot of time discussing the specifics of the war, the spoils, how it was allocated, etc. That's a, There's a lot of numbers there. In any case, now we get to the episode. The tribes of Reuven and Gad, later joined by half the tribes of Manasseh, ask for the lands east of the Jordan as their portion in the promised land. These being prime pasture land for their cattle. Moses is initially angered by the request, but subsequently agrees on the condition that they first join and lead in Israel's conquest of the lands west of the Jordan. So just to picture what's happening here, Imagine all the Jewish people are camped at the Jordan River, opposite Jericho, ready to cross the Jordan and enter the Promised Land. And all of a sudden, two tribes say, we don't want to go into the Promised Land. We're perfectly happy right where we are. We know already from last Parsha, last really last two, three Parshas, that that land east of the Jordan River, which is modern day Jordan, that land was conquered by the Jewish people because there were two kings that tried to block the Jewish people's passage, Sichon and Og. The Jewish people conquered that land, and now we have a vast amount of land, which is perfect for pasture. And there were two tribes who have a lot of cattle, and they say, we don't want to go into Israel. And Moshe sees this as, as this terrible crisis because 
he remembers the trauma of 40 years earlier. What happened 40 years earlier? The spies didn't want to go into Israel. What was the result? We were delayed for 40 years. So Moses goes into, Moses is, uh, is, is, is very upset. But then the people agree that no. Well, that, we'll read the details if we have time. The people sort of say, no, you misunderstood us or you didn't misunderstand us, depending on how you read the story. But in any case, they agree that they will go first in war. They're not afraid of the battle. They're not afraid of the battle. We're not, we'll go first. And that we get this land, because this land for us, that's what they felt. Moshe agrees. That is the first portion, the portion of Mato. And now we go, now we go to the final portion, the portion of Masse, which literally means journeys, and also a lot of names and technicalities. Here we go. The 42 journeys and encampments of Israel are listed. So we literally get a list. They left from this place, they camped in that place. They left from this place, camped in that place. 42, 42 places. From the Exodus to their encampment at the plains of Moab across the river from the land of Canaan. In other words, opposite the river, opposite the Jordan River across Canaan. The boundaries of the promised land are given and the cities of refuge are designated as havens and places of exile for inadvertent murderers. So the story, of course, is that if somebody kills someone by mistake in ancient Israel, the law was that the, 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 the penalty was, not penalty, the, the result was that if you kill someone by mistake, the relative is able to avenge the blood of the, of the, of the victim and, you could, and he can kill you. What you can do as a as a uh, inadvertent murderer is if you run and you hide and you live, you don't have to hide, you live in one of the cities of refuge, you are protected as long as you stay in that city. So we'll talk about that and what the significance is and what the, what the value of that is. We'll get to that later. In any case, one more story, it sounds like a technicality, but the daughters of Tzalafchad marry within their own tribe of Menashe so that their estate, which they inherit from their father, should not pass to the prov province of another tribe. Last week, we read about the issue. There was a man who died who had no sons. The daughters, the five daughters, his five daughters approached Moses and they say, we want to inherit because we don't have a father. Moses goes to God. God says they are right. And that becomes part of the laws of inheritance. Now there is a problem. The members of the tribe, of their tribe of Menashe, they're afraid. They say, one second, these women are inheriting land amongst the tribe of Menashe. If they marry out of the tribe, what's going to happen is that because the tribe follows the, um, um, the father, the paternal line, our land will transfer to another tribe. So they complain to Moses. So Moses says, okay, you know what? A, a woman who inherits land should marry within her own tribe. The commentaries explain that that was specific for that generation. Only when we enter the land of Israel was it important that the division of tribes be um, kept uh, um, and be, and be, and be um, what, what is it, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Should be, should be complete. Afterward, however, intermarriage between the tribes, which would allow for the, the um, estates to travel between tribes actually is, prob is actually probably a good thing because that allows for the uh, connection between the tribes that they should be literally mingled between each other and not just specifically um, and, and not just completely separate. But that's the rabbinic interpretation. When you read the verse, it basically, it seems like it says, it says that's the law, but the rabbis say, well, that's only, that's only the, that's only the, that, that was for that generation specifically. In any case, that's the conclusion of the book. And we'll see later why is this episode of all episodes the conclusion of the book? So we have a lot to talk about, thank God. We're not going to be bored for the next 45 minutes. Thank God. Um, if anybody has any specific themes you want to address, you want to raise, please do. Otherwise, we'll, we'll see what happens. There's a lottery. We'll just put something, pull something out of the box and we'll go. Go ahead, um, Fega. Uh, Rabbi, I have a quick question. It's not about the kind of uh, the actual parsha, but uh, you mentioned that the, the relatives of somebody who was killed by mistake can go ahead and um, and may or may kill 
that that person, although he did murder by mistake. So how does Tora view that? Is it something that that will be prosecuted, or this is something that encouraged? So what does the Tora say about it? If not here, maybe somewhere else. That's an excellent question, because it raises it, it raises some interesting questions. So how about we start from there and we'll branch out. So we'll sort of start from the middle. Um, Ricky raises a few technical questions. I, I'll address the technical questions to the best of my ability, and then we'll try to uh, address the, 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 the philosophical question of what exactly the city of, of refuge is doing. So, and why it's here, why it's so important that it's right here. And you'll see later that this is the law of the city of refuge is something that it, Moshe emphasizes no less than three times. It's written in this Parsha, and it's written twice in the book of Numbers, of Deuteronomy, in the fifth book. It seems like something that we keep emphasizing, and the question is, how come? But let's deal with the technicalities first. Um, the way you read the story literally, it seems like the scenario is if somebody kills someone by mistake, they could go, and the relative has the right, doesn't say obligation, but has the right to go and kill the inadvertent murderer or avenge the blood that we would call Goel Adam, redeem the blood. And in that, and, and in that case, and if they do so outside of the city of refuge, there's no penalty for the relative, if that makes sense. The question is, should they? And the question is, does this apply in all cases? So there's a full tractate in the Talmud called tractate Makot, which literally means, uh, um, really, it literally Makot means uh, penalties, or literally means, it means like hitting, but it means penalties or lashes. And Makot focuses, most of Makot focuses on, not most, but a good, large portion of Makot fo focuses on the laws of the city of refuge. And there, the Talmud analyzes the verses. And the Talmud an analyzes the verses and analyzes the scenario. There's a very specific scenario given to the scenario of the inadvertent murderer. So let's read it inside. If you have the book, if not, I'll just read it to you just to get a flavor of what the Talmud is saying. And it's not just pulling things out of the hat, but... Let's find it. Um, if, you look, if you have an art scroll, you can look at page 929. If you don't have an art scroll, not that the art scroll is not an, an endorsement for the art scroll, but in any case, it's just convenience. But it's chapter 35 of the book of Numbers, chapter 35, verse, verse I guess we'll start from... I guess we'll start from verse 11, but we'll skip in a moment to verse to verse 16. So you know what, maybe I'll pull it up for the benefit of those who don't have the book in front of them. We'll do it quickly. Um, she, she, let's say, um, text and summaries, uh, Torah reading. She, she, change your mind. Okay, so this is chapter 35, verse 9. I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 35, uh, verse 9. Uh, let's look at, I'll read a few verses, why not? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, and I'm on page 929, page 929, verse 9. 929, verse, verse 9. Okay. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, our translations will differ because I'm reading a different translation. Speak to the children of Israel. One second. I'm not sharing it. I thought I'm sharing it. I'm not sharing it. Let me share it. That's better. Okay. Um, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you cross the Jordan to the land of Canaan, you shall designate cities for yourselves. They shall be cities of refuge for you. And a murderer who killed a person unintentionally intentionally shall flee there. These cities shall serve you as a refuge from, the, from an avenger so that the murderer shall not die until he stands in judgment before the, con before the congregation. So this is a very interesting verse. 12 says as follows, the, the way the rabbis derive it. 12 doesn't say that it's a city of refuge. It says it's a city of refuge until there's a judgment. So the, so, so the Talmud derives from this, that if I kill someone by mis either by mistake or on purpose, it doesn't matter. If I kill somebody, I could run to the city of refuge and get refuge until there's a trial once there's a, because that's what verse that's what that's what really that's what verse 12 says until he stands in judgment before the congregation until there's a trial so even if i killed someone on purpose 
if I stay home, the relative can kill me, no problem. If I run to the city of refuge, I'm protected, protected until the trial. Then the, the court would come and, and, and bring me to trial. Now at trial, we determine what happened. And if it was determined that I killed someone on purpose and all the conditions are met, that's capital punishment. If not, this actually sounds interesting. There's actually two scenarios. One scenario would be where the town would say, where the, where the court would say, okay, you killed by mistake. And you killed by mistake, you have the right to be protected by the city of refuge. And, but here's the surprising point. Sometimes the Talmud would say, it was not by mistake. In other words, it was negligence. It was gross negligence. It was what the Talmud would call shaygeg karav lamezid. It was by mistake, but it's close to being on purpose. In other words, you were very negligent. If you're very negligent, then what's the law? The law then becomes, you have no protection from the city of refuge. If cities of refuge don't protect you, because the city of refuge were designed to someone who did by mistake without gross negligence. But if I killed someone with gross negligence, what's the law? The law is you stay home. The city of refuge can't protect you. Well, what should you do? The guy, the relative can come at night and kill you. No problem, hire a security company. Buy, buy, a, buy, buy a rifle, do whatever you want. That's, that's the law of the Talmud. It's, fascinating. it's a very interesting thing. What kind, of, what kind of society do we want where people will take the law into their own hands? So that's a, that's a discussion, but I, but I think I first wanted to, to address the technical issue. And where does the Talmud get that from? The Talmud gets that from, look at the case. Look at the case. Um, the Talmud says, if he struck, the verse says, if he struck him with an iron instrument and he dies, he is a murderer and the murderer shall be put to death. If he struck him with a fist sized stone, which is deadly and he dies, he is a murderer and the murderer shall be put to death. Or with a fist sized wooden instrument, which is deadly and he dies, he is a murderer and the murderer shall be put to death. In other words, what the Talmud is saying over here is that you have to look at the weapon. What the verse is saying, you have to look at the weapon. And then Let's continue. Verse 20, if out of hatred he pushed him or threw something at him with premeditation and he died, or if he maliciously struck him with his hand and he died, the assailant shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The blood avenger may kill the murderer when he meets him. But if he pushed him accidentally without malice or threw an object at him without premeditation or with any stone which is deadly and without seeing his victim, he threw it down at him and he killed him, but he was not his enemy and bore no malice. Then the avenger, uh, then the congregation shall judge between the assailant and the blood avenger on the basis of these judgments. The congregation shall protect the murderer from the hand of the blood avenger and the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge to which he fled and shall remain there until the Kohen Gadol who anointed him with the with sacred oil dies. We'll get to that, that aspect is a different point. The point here is, we look at and see the scenario, what weapon? If I use a weapon that is dangerous, then you can't say, oh, I didn't mean to kill. I just meant to throw it on you. Yeah, if it's, if it's metal, if it's a, a large stone, that, that would be considered gross negligence. And later in the book of Numbers, you see, when the book of Deuteronomy, that's the case that I thought it would say here, but it doesn't say it here. It says in, in, in Deuteronomy, you have a case of someone chopping wood, case of something chopping wood. And while I'm chopping wood, the ax, falls out of my hand and lands on somebody's head and kills him. That's the scenario. Let's find it in a second. So you're not, you, you don't think I'm just kind of making up stories. Um, Okay, if you want to look, I'm not, if you want to look, it's at, in Deuteronomy, it's, if you have an art scroll, it's 1035. Otherwise, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 5. Deuteronomy 19, 5. Let's see if I can find it. Deuteronomy. On page 1035, it's verse... 
So I'm looking at, it's on the screen, Deuteronomy 19.5. As when a man goes with his fellow into the forest to chop wood and his hand swings the ax to cut down the tree and the iron flies off the handle and it reaches his fellow and he dies, he shall flee to one of these cities and live. And we continue to, to describe the laws of the city of refuge. So the Talmud, but now I don't have time to go into every detail here, but the Talmud analyzes both this case, both this, these verses and the verses in our parsha, and combines the two and says, we're talking about a specific case. We're talking about someone who kills by mistake, but it's not gross negligence. Gross negligence, you don't have protection from the city of refuge. What do you do? Protect yourself. How would that help? What kind of society? We'll leave that for a moment, but that's just a technical issue. That's the, I'm sorry. So first thing we address the technical issue, who is covered by this city of refuge? Now we want to go to the moral question, um, not the, the value question. What is the Torah saying and why is it so important to emphasize the cities of refuge and why is it so important to do so three times from here in the last 37 days of Moshe's life? Moshe speaks about it no less than three times. And one of the theories is as follows. The problem, anytime you have a big idea and building a state is a big idea, we're going into the land of Israel, we're building a society. So the problem becomes is that now we have a national goal. And the problem with national goals is we don't suffer so much from this problem in the West today, but just a few generations ago, this was common. You think about the goal, you lose sight of the individual. So you say, look, we're building, we're building a society. So what? There's going to be accidents. People are going to die by mistake, but it's too bad. We have a goal. The goal is to build the country, to build a society, to build a, the, the national project. If people are going to die on the, on the way, too bad. We have to sacrifice the individual on the, on the altar of this national project, whatever it may be. And if you look back at this country or any country, and you look back at Google and figure out how many people died building this thing or that thing, it gets pretty scary. Um, the point here is we're going into Israel. So we're sort of forming this collective country. What does the Torah say? Make sure that the state understands, or the people understands, building the state understands that the foundation of the collective is the individual. So you can't sacrifice the individual on the altar of the collective. You can't say, look, we have to build a country. So if you're building and by mistake, you kill someone with the ax, you should get a medal. Why? Because you're building for the country, you're building the state. So what does the Torah say? No, no, no. The state's only power is that, is that it protects and values the individual. So if I kill someone by mistake, the city of refuge, the institution of the city of refuge tells you, reminds us of the value of the individual that even if someone is killed by mistake, there is a penalty. And even if he's killed by mistake in the context of doing something grand and great and holy and amazing, like the building of Israel, a building of a national project. No, the, the, the Torah is telling us that we have to be mindful, even in the process of building the country, you have to be mindful of the, of the life and the value of every individual. And therefore, even when you're building, even if you have a good cause to build, you have to be um, super careful, make sure nobody's passing under you when you're chopping wood. And if you don't, then even though you're, it's not gross negligence, but it's, you still have moral responsibility and therefore you still need atonement and you still need to go to the city of refuge and um, you still need to go to the city of refuge and you will uh, be, 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 be atoned for. But even though there's a good case to make, it's not my fault, it's not my fault. I'm, I'm doing it for a good cause and building the country. It was by mistake, it was an accident. Okay, but what the Torah is telling you here is to build a moral society, you have to be you have, to be, um, you have to be super sensitive to the right of the individual because there's no value to the collective. The only value of the collective is that it protects the individual. You can't sacrifice the individual. So that is why Moshe is emphasizing this three times, no less than three times in a matter of a few weeks. So I thought that was a, that, that's, a, that's a very nice interpretation. And um, okay, I think it's enough for now, even though we could still talk about what type of we, we could still add, but maybe, maybe we'll look at another theme unless somebody has any question or follow up. We could do follow-ups and then we could, and then we could um, address the other things because there's so much to talk about. So what about the relative? Is he gonna be persecuted if he tried to kill somebody? It depends. If he kills someone that has no protection from the city of refuge and the person is in the city of refuge, he's guilt, the relative will be, will be considered a murderer. But if we're talking about a case where they stood trial and the court said, 
either that this person is not entitled to the protection from the city of refuge because it was gross negligence, according to the Talmud, or that the person is entitled to, to, to protection from the city of refuge, but this person just left the city of refuge and the relative fi finds him and kills him, the relative is off the hook. Now, should the relative kill him is a separate question. The Torah doesn't say that. And I, 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 I have what to say on this. I just hesitate to say it because I don't know if it's true. But uh, I could tell you my theory, but, but my theory is just as good as anybody else's. Certainly not better, maybe worse. So um, um, I don't know, Let, let's just think about this for a second. Um, what are you gonna tell the relative? If you tell the relative, your relative w w was killed by mistake. And remember, we're talking about a society that the society believes in capital punishment. Um, even though it's not practiced because of legal, um, legal, legal um, precautions. So it's very uncommon, but as a principle, as a moral principle, we believe in capital punishment for murder, okay? So what are you gonna tell somebody? You're gonna tell someone there was gross negligence, but you cannot, the word the Torah uses certainly in Deuteronomy page uh, um, um, chapter 19, uh, maybe also in our Parsha, but in Deuteronomy, I look at, I just have it pulled out in front of me. So we'll look at Deuteronomy for a second. Deuteronomy says, um, six, lest the avenger of the blood pursue the killer while his heart is hot. He's so angry that, that my, my, my relative was killed with gross negligence. His heart is hot. His heart is hot, so I go and I kill. I, I, I'm the relative, I kill the, the inadvertent, inadvertent murderer. What are you going to tell someone? Cool down? Your heart shouldn't be hot? That's a problem. Because that's saying that the value of life, your, your, your fellow, your cousin, your friend was killed, your relative was killed, doesn't matter. Take it easy. Don't be upset. No, we want people to be upset that somebody was killed. We want your heart to be hot. On the other hand, we don't say you have to kill. We say you can. What's likely to happen in my view is if I can kill, only me, not the court, I can't outsource it to the court. I can kill, then I'm not gonna kill. Do you see what I'm saying? Because you give me the responsibility, you give me the choice, and then I hesitate. So the Torah is basically saying, what are we gonna say? There's a case of gross negligence. The person is not entitled to the protection of a city, uh, the protection of a city of refuge. We're happy that the relative is upset. I don't think we're, we're not saying we're happy that the relative should kill, but we're saying if he does, he's off the hook. But we think, I think we think that if you say, yeah, you can kill if you want to, ironically, if you'd say you can't, then the person would go and kill him. If you say you could, okay, I'll think about it. I don't have to do it now, I'll do it in 20 years. Oh, in 20 years, my heart is not hot anymore. So you just have to think about this. Not a question. It's not only a question that we know. Uh, um, Talmudic scholars and lawyers think everything is, le is 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 legalese. Everything is a legal thing. But if you have to think about, we have to bring in the psychologist to think about what this would do. Allowing people the permission in some cases to kill. What would that do? Would that increase or decrease the 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 cases of murder? I don't know. That's just food for thought. It reminds me when I used to teach in the Bronx. This was we had a lot of gang members, and you know kids who hadn't made it anywhere else. And we had a committee called Fairness that was only run by the kids with one teacher advisor. And when the kids got upset with each other or with a teacher or a teacher with the kid, they could bring the person to fairness. And this was only kids making the decision. And 90% of the time when the kids were upset, they'd go storming out of a classroom, cursing at a teacher. And I could go up to them and say, but you can bring the teacher to fairness and they'd go, Oh, okay. And 90% of the time they didn't take him to fairness, but they knew they had the option and all the anger disappeared. Right. Right. On the other, on the other hand, I used to go, we, we used to camp in Northern Michigan and there was a true story. I must've been uh, 14. So I was a little shocked that there was a, a, a attendant in the gas station next to the camp. And he was talking to us and he says that the, his parents were in a car accident and they were seriously wounded. And the guy didn't even get a ticket. Um, the, the, the person who wounded their parents 
So we said, what are you going to do? He said, just going to wait for the hunting season. Aye. So uh, that's, that's the other side of the coin. So <laughs> yes, go ahead, Warren. Rabbi, a question. Um, the text refers to an avenger. And then I, I see in the footnotes, avenger of the blood. And then I also hear or see close in the footnotes, close relative. What what defines an avenger in, in the text? What defines avenger? And what do we mean by a close relative? And That's why a good question. That's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to the second part. Goyal Hadam, the verse, the, 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 the translation, at least to what I'm looking at it on in Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 19:6, it says, Avenger of the blood. Um, um, what does it say in our parsha? Let me take a quick peek. Goyal Hadam, also the blood avenger in our parsha, which is which is verse uh, numbers 35, verse, verse 16, verse 19. It says avenger of the blood. Now, what exactly is a close relative? I don't, I don't know. To, I can't say offhand. What I would say is all throughout the Bible, including the five books of Moses, a redeemer is a relative. What are some of the cases? Some of the cases at the end of the third book, there's a scenario where if I sell my uh, inheritance land, a relative can come in and buy it back because to keep the field in the family. That's called a goel or redeemer. It's very famous in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth was the book where um, Ruth, Ruth, Ruth's husband really dies. And we know that there was the mitzvah of the Leverite marriage, which now after the giving of a Torah applies only to a brother, but, 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 but in, in biblical times, the obligation only applies to the brother. But in biblical times, the custom was that it would be any close relative, the closest relative, and if you read the book of, if you read the, if you read the 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 book of Ruth, the, ultimately the person who ends up marrying her is Boaz, who is a distant relative, but there was a closer relative, and the closer relative de declined to marry Ruth, even though he should have, and therefore they had to go to Boaz, had to say to the closer relative. Do you agree to 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 give me the rights to do the Levite marriage? And the and the and the the closer relative says, I will, I don't want to marry her. So then Boaz, who's the distant relative, ends up marrying her, distant relative of her deceased husband. Over there, the closer relative goes nameless. Goes nameless, Almoni, which means just the uh, John Doe. We don't know. Goes nameless, but it refers to him time and again as Goel, the Redeemer. The redeemer. What does it mean a redeemer? Redeemer, so it's not just in the context, redeemer of the blood means someone who's coming to avenge the blood. But a redeemer in, in, the, in the Bible means I am a relative and it's my job to step in for the family when something is needed. What is that something? Well, it could be to kill the, uh, to, to take revenge. It could be to redeem a field who we, because a family member fell into poverty and sold the, 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 the ancestral land, I want to buy it back. Or it could be uh, for, the, for the purpose of marriage, because the, the woman's husband, my relative died, and so and a relative has to stand in for the deceased husband. But you see, that that's the term goel. Now, you're asking me regarding the option to kill a relative, is there a limitation of how close you have to be? Short answer is I don't know. Short, the longer answer is I have to check. Um, so yeah, so I don't know. You said there are three times that, that cities of refuge are mentioned. What's the third time then? Third time is, is, uh, is so we have in Shoftim, which is Deuteronomy 19, and you also have in Deuteronomy in Ve'et Hanan, the second portion of Deuteronomy, where it's a little bit shorter, but it does mention it again, because it talks about how Moses actually designates those three cities. Uh, um, Mo Moses designates three cities. Basically, there were three cities in Israel proper, and then there's later another three cities east of the Jordan, uh, because that's one, once the two and a half tribes, once the two and a half tribes um, ask and get the land east of the Jordan. So now we need we need cities of refuge east of the Jordan. And in, in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 20, verse forty one, it talks about how Moshe designates 
the, not the three that are in Israel because they didn't conquer Israel yet, but he designates three cities of refuge east of the Jordan. Now, all I'm trying to say is this was a big idea, it was famous, we have three cities. And later we're gonna see that in this week's parasha, I'm pretty sure it says, Tachin lecha haderech, you have to prepare the road. You have to make sure there are highways to run to the cities of refuge and you need signs for the cities of refuge. Now, you can read this to say, we're just trying to save the, the relative, the inadvertent murderer from the relative. That's one way to read it. There's a very technical reading. Or you could say, by making a big deal in this country, wherever you're driving on, on the highway, imagine you're driving on the 95 and it says 50 miles from the city of refuge, 20 miles from the cities of refuge, 10 miles from the city of refuge. What, is it, what, what does this awaken in your consciousness? It keeps telling you, be careful about human life. In modern English, it says, don't text and drive, right? Mm -hmm. Be sensitive, right? Because, because we, we don't think about how you have to be so careful about human life, but the institution and the signs and everything making a big deal about the cities of refuge say, you have to understand that even if you do it by mistake, even if you're not careful, you have moral responsibility. And therefore, the more, the more the, the society that's built around that it has to be divided exactly, you divide Israel into thirds, then you have to equal, divide the cities equal distance from each other. And from the borders of Israel, this is whole institution of the cities of refuge. What, to protect the 10 people who killed by mistake? No, it's that, that too. But it's to inculcate within the population the importance of human life, that even taking human life by mistake with negligence, even if it's not gross negligence, the gross negligence, certainly not, but even some degree of negligence is, 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 is a difficult problem, is a moral problem. Go ahead, Warren. Oh, I, uh, I'm wondering, given what you just said is, as one proceeds through the Tanakh and the history of, of, of Israel and the Jewish people, do cities in, of refuge figure in, in subsequent uh, events? There is, a, there is um, I'm, I'm sure the answer is yes. I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not, I, I can't just speak, speak from memory, but there is a notion of, there is a notion like with Saul, Ir Hakonim, Saul, there was Nov. Nov was a city of priests. And King David was running away from Saul, and he and he took refuge in the city of uh, and he took took refuge in the city of Nov, the city of the priests. And Saul was so upset that 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 this, the priests harbored David, he went and he killed out the entire city. And if you think about why did David go to Nov, why did he go to the city of the priests? So I, I believe I recall that some would say it's the same function because the Levite the cities of the Levite cities were. The, the cities of refuge were cities where the Levites lived. Why Levites? Because Levites were the ones who did not have a portion in the land. So they were dedicated, dedicated to spirituality. So the point is the person who kills by mistake um, needs to repent. And the way you repent is you surround yourself with the cities of, with, 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 the, with the Levites because the Levites are dedicated to spirituality. So some say that similar concept would be with, uh, with D David runs to take refuge with the city of the priests because the priests are not involved in politics, at least they shouldn't be, and they're involved in, uh, they're involved in holiness. So you would assume that it's sort of a, a territory protected. Saul violates that and kills out the entire city. Even today, you open the news and you, you hear about the people who, who are, uh, let's say, running away from immigration, they would try to find refuge in a church, right? Where does that come from? People would, people would view a house of worship to be a place where could you suspend your regular politics and make us make a sacred space? And in some sense, the city of refuge is that because it's it's the Levite cities. That's part of what creates the rehabilitation for the inadvertent murderer, which we said from our perspective, inadvertent murderer is only you still have moral responsibility because you were when it comes to human life, you have to be careful to the extreme. By the way, I made a mis I didn't make a mistake. I missed something. When you go to court, there are cases where, just like I said, there's gross negligence. I don't know the legal term in English, but the, the Hebrew term, so you have shogeg, you have a mistake that's close to on purpose, but you also have a mistake that's close to onus. A mistake that's also, that's close to onus means that you were forced, it was against, it was against your will. In other words, if it's totally out of your hands, the court would say, you don't have to go to the city of refuge, and this relative cannot harm you. In other words, there's really three levels. There's gross negligence. There's the regular case, which is the case we're talking about, which is negligence. Now, I, don't know, I don't know if negligence is the right word. When it comes to human life, it's considered negligence. In other words, you did not do everything in your power to protect against it. 
And then you're required to get atonement because that's the whole point. When it comes to human life, you can't say it wasn't so careful. You're getting into that car, you put both hands on that steering wheel because it's human life in your hands, right? And, 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 and on the other hand, if the court determines that you did everything in your power, then, and it was an act of God, it was an act out of your, out of your, out of your power, then they call that a mistake, That's but it's close to being an onus. It's close to being out of your control. And therefore you would not need to go to the city of refuge and what else? And you would not need to, you would not need to, um, you would not need, and, and you would be protected and the relative cannot kill you even though you're not going to the city of refuge. For more information, we have to study the track gate of Makot where it gets very technical because it gets, talks about chopping wood. In some, it gets very technical, which the, when you chop wood, there's different strokes. There's the stroke, you have to lift the, 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 the ax and you bring it down. So what's more likely that a mistake will happen? That the metal will fall out of the handle. The, the metal, the metal axe, the metal um, um, ax will fall out of the wooden handle on the way up or the way down. Where do you have to be more careful? I haven't learned it in many years, so I don't remember. The point here is that we get into the, the nitty gritty cases. Is this negligence? Is this gross negligence? Is it closer to, to, to uh, is totally out of my control? So uh, the lawyers will be kept busy. will be happy with the track date of Makot. But again, it, it is a law, but every law represents the value. And the value here is, especially before you're going into Israel, where you're trying to build a country, where the focus would now become to be collective. There's no such thing as a collective. The value of the collective, the, the collective cannot be uh, um, um, desensitized to the um, value of the individual. And if it does, it's gonna be an immoral society. And therefore, put up those signs of how far we are to the city of refuge and make the roads because we're here to educate, not just, the, not, not just to, to tell the person who killed, here's the way to go, but knowing about this institution of the city of refuge, hopefully reminds us to be extra careful when it comes to human life. Okay, a lot more to say, this, the time is slipping by, so we have, to, we have to make a comeback and grab control of the time. Uh, we can't do that, but at least we can try. Okay, one thing I wanted to mention, because this is gonna tie into what I wanna say about the end of the book, is that Some of these stories, if you look deep, if you look deep between the stories, um, there is a theme. Some of these stories are is are related to Joseph, and Joseph is the uh, is the I guess in some sense, how do I say this? I don't want to say the main character, but in some sense, Joseph is the best, the main character. In other words, the most complete character of the book of Genesis, and. You see it playing out at the end of the Torah, which, like I said, we're referring to Joseph. We're referring to we're referring to the son, the the numbers as the end of the Torah, because that's where the stories end before the repetition. And Joseph, Joseph's personality, even though it's not always in an overt way, sometimes it's a little concealed. But Joseph shines. Where do you see this? I'm referring to two stories. First of all, the five daughters, five daughters of Tzalafad, are the descendants of Menashe son of Joseph. So we spend a lot of time toward the end of the book dealing with these five women. But these five women, it keeps emphasizing that the daughters of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. So this Joseph, the Joseph theme is mentioned. Another point where you see where Joseph is mentioned, even not mentioned, but Joseph is important here, is part of the story of the two, two and a half tribes that want land east of the Jordan. So what happens is two of the tribes want, east, want land east of the Jordan, and we're not going to go into the negotiation between Moses. Moses is a very good negotiator. He gets a very good deal from his perspective. He gets them, the, the people of, of God and Reuven, to go first. But the point here is this. Two tribes ask to go east of the Jordan. Moshe himself is upset. He's not happy that the, that the tribes want to be east of the Jordan. Um, history tells us that the fact that they wanted to go east of the Jordan was not such a good thing. Why? Because the, 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 the Torah points out that later, when the 10 tribes went to exile, the 10 tribes were exiled in the, times of, in, in, the, in the era of the king of Assyria, but so it's about 600 years after they entered the land. The 10 tribes went to exile in waves, and the first wave was the two and a half tribes that were, who were east of the Jordan. And the verse says, Nachlem of Ohelet, because they rushed to get their inheritance east of the Jordan, the first one's in, now the first one's out. So it indicates that it wasn't such a great idea. It wasn't so, it wasn't, it wasn't so positive that they went east of the Jordan. Ultimately, they're going outside of, of Israel. 
They're going outside of biblical Israel. So it's not such a hot idea. However, this is a very strange phenomenon. What's the strange phenomenon? That we end up, Moshe ends up giving not two tribes the way the two tribes who asked to be east of the Jordan, Reuven and God, but Moshe gives it to Reuven, God, and half the tribe of Menashe. One second, why half the tribe of Menashe? They don't want to be east of the Jordan. They want to be in Israel. Why are you putting half the tribe east of the Jordan? So it's not clear. One answer is that Ver Torah does not address this issue. One answer is, well, Moshe says, oh, we're already allocating this land. We have so much land here. We can't just give it to two tribes. If we're incorporating this land as part of Israel, then we've got too much land. You know what? Menashe is, was, heavy, was, was a very populated tribe. Let's split Menashe in half. That's the, that's the conventional answer. But it's not fair. Menashe doesn't want to be east of the Jordan. Just because Reuven and God want to be east of the Jordan, that's why you're splitting Menashe? So here, this comes to the more mystical and spiritual answer. The mystical spiritual answer is that there's a danger of the Jordan River. What's the danger? The danger is it's a, it's a natural border. That's why if you have to defend the land of Israel, no, nope, even, even, even most people on the left say Israel needs to control the Jordan Valley. You need that, the, Jordan, the valley, but, also the, but you also need the eastern border must be the Jordan. It's a, it's a, it's a physical marker. It's a physical... It's a physical uh, um, obstacle. You need, you need the, the Jordan River. But the Jordan River is a block. It's, a, it's an obstacle. If you have two tribes east of the Jordan, 10 tribes west of the Jordan, the danger is that the two tribes will ultimately not see themselves as part of the 10 tribes and they will fall away from the Jewish people. So what do you need to do? You need to create a bridge. What do you do for a bridge? You take one tribe, split them in half. That tribe, it goes back and forth because Passover, they wanna be by this grandmother. And Hanukkah, they go to the other grandmother. Problem is one grandmother lives east of the Jordan, one grandmother lives west of the Jordan. Other tribes, no, we all live together in the tribe, right? So the fact that you split a tribe in two, you're dividing this, splitting the tribe and, and sort of asking half of the tribe to sacrifice their presence in Israel. But what you gain is their create, their being the metaphorical bridge between over the Jordan. Okay, of all the tribes, why Menashe? What did Joseph do wrong? What did Menashe do wrong? What's the answer? The answer is go back to Joseph's figure in, 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 in the book of Genesis. What's Joseph's skill? Joseph's skill was the ability to remain loyal to the teachings of the patriarchs, even when he was alone in foreign territory, in spiritually foreign territory, in a foreign culture, in, in Egypt. While being in Egypt, he could maintain his own spiritual identity. He also gave that to his son, Menashe and Ephraim. Menashe, was, Menashe and Ephraim were born, were born in Egypt before the rest of the family came. And we're not gonna get into the details here, but Menashe more than Ephraim represents the ability not to forget the past. It's built into his name. Menashe means, means forgetting, but it means remember that you better be careful, otherwise you may forget, ironically. So the point here is, the point here is that if you need someone to be outside of Israel, but to remember and remain loyal to the values of Israel, you will hire Joseph or Joseph's son or Joseph's son Menashe. So that's the bridge. So we see the power of Joseph that we read about in the end of uh, the book, of, in the second half of the book of Genesis. And it's very hard not to fall into in love with Joseph's character. He is unlike the other tribes who are close to their parents and uh, geographically in Israel and yet more struggle um, uh, with moral struggles. Joseph being distant from his, from, from his society and from the family, and he's in the height of, in the center of the Egypt, which was considered a corrupt society, and yet he remains loyal, and that's Joseph. Okay, now, of, so I told you that the tribe of Manasseh is the, serves as the bridge, because some members of the tribe are on one side, other members of the tribe on the other side. Of Manasseh, who's the real bridge? The real bridge, and that's why we spend so much time on the daughters of, of Tzlafchad, the real bridge are those girls. Why? Because they married members of their tribe. The, the Talmud basically tells us that it turns out that, that the girls and their husbands own land on opposite sides of, sides of the Jordan because they're both in the tribe of Menashe. So the girl has on one side, their husband has on the other side. When they marry, they literally, these five families, these five daughters, own land on both sides of the Jordan. That's the anomaly. Nobody else in Israel does that. 
because every other tribe is either on one side or the other side. You get an inheritance, wherever your inheritance you get. Either you're on one side or the other side. Even if you're in Menashe, you're either on one side or you're on the other side. Where do you have a woman who inherits land and marry someone who inherits land? Because usually the women did not inherit land unless they have no brothers. The point of the matter is these five women that we're making a big deal about are the ones who connect the, who bridge Israel and outside of Israel. And the Hasidic interpretation says it's much broader than just um, serving as a connection. It's really the bridge that's the spiritual flow represents the ability of the holiness of Israel to expand outside of Israel. And if we are in the time being living in Greenwich, Connecticut, we turn to the daughters of Joseph and to the tribe of, of Menashe in general and to, the, and to the image of Joseph as the model of what we're supposed to do. We are in a sense living east of the Jordan. We're living in land that is not part of Israel, but it's our job to sanctify it. So that's that really the conclusion of the four, fifth book is that we, or the fourth book is that remember that the holiness of Israel does not have to be tracked within Israel. It can expand. If you follow the, the personality and the, and, the, and the example of Joseph and his son Manasseh, and especially of the five daughters who we say they had a great love for the land of Israel, then you can actually expand, expand to outside of Israel. Now saying that, I wanna go and I wanna read the last two verses of the Bible, of, of, the, of the portion, just to show how it closes and finding the big themes. Um, I may have said this in the past, but I love it so much, so I'm gonna say it again. So if you turn it to the book, if you turn, if you turn on the art scroll, it would be page 935. I'm gonna to try to share the screen here so we can all do this together. And, and customarily, we would say chazak, chazak. Let's see if I can maneuver. Seventh reading, go to the complete. Okay, so I'm at the end. And this is basically um, the story. So they marry, verse 11. The last, we'll read the last three verses of the Bible, and then we'll, of, the, of the book, and then we'll say chazak, chazak, mit chazek. So verse 11, Machla, Tirza, Chagla, Milka, and Noah married their cousins, right? Members of the same tribe. They married into the families of the sons of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. Like I said, we keep emphasizing it as the son of Joseph because Joseph is the prototype. Joseph is the one who taught how you can be outside of Israel but be connected to Israel. And their inheritance remained with the tribe of their father's family. Now this is the concluding verse. These are the commandments and the ordinances that the Lord commanded to the children of Israel through Moses in the plains of, of Moab, by the, by, by the Jordan at Jericho. And like we say, chazak, chazak, benit chazek, be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little Kabbalistic interpretation over here from a 16th century ca Kabbalist. Um, he wrote a book called Sror Hamor. He actually ended up in Israel, I believe. I believe he ended up in Israel, maybe Italy, but I think he ended up in Israel. No, he did, he ended up in Israel. And he himself was one of the people who were expelled from Spain. So he's part of the uh, Jews who ended up in Israel and started the Kabbalistic Renaissance after the expulsion of the Spanish expulsion. He writes as follows. He says a very interesting thing. The words, almost the last words of the book, at the plains of Moab, the Arvot Moab, plains of Moab. Now, let's see if we can play with these words. Our vote is plains, but there's another word what, what, our, our, um, um, what the root, what the root I and Reish base, what the word, root of that word means. There's multiple words, it could be a roof. We're gonna look at the, at the root meaning uh, the guarantor. In modern, even in, a modern, even in modern Hebrew, but uh, certainly in biblical Hebrew, if you need somebody to guarantor, either to, how do I hang up? If you need to guarantee either guarantee a loan or any other form of guarantor, you get a, what they call an arev. Arev is a guarantor. So you can read this by the guarantor of Moab. What's Moab? So we know the etymology of the name Moab literally means from my father. And it's a strange, it's a strange name. It comes from a strange context. It comes from Moab was the, was the, was the son of the daughter of Lot. If you go back to Genesis, you know that after the destruction of the city of Sodom, um, the girls, the two girls, uh, the survivors, Lot's daughters thought that the entire world was destroyed except for their father. So they have a child from their father. They get him drunk and they have a child from their father because they think that they have to repopulate the earth and there's nobody else. 
The older one, elder one names her son Me'av, from my father. Bad name because you don't have to advertise it. Second one doesn't advertise it, Amon, it's a little bit more concealed, but Moab from my father. So it's clear Moab is from my father. Our vote, Moab, guarantor for the father. What's a guarantor? A guarantor is the one who corrects, who comes. I, have, I took a loan, I have a moral obligation to repay. I can't, the person, my arave, my guarantor will come and correct it for me. What are they saying here? They're saying, says, says, says uh, the Torah Hamor, says as follows. He says, what's happening here? What's happening here is this generation that the second, not the one who left Egypt, but the generation of 40 years later, they correct their mistake of their fathers. Their fathers rejected Israel and they loved Israel. And the epitome of their love for Israel represents the five girls who want an inheritance in the land and the tribe of Menashe who are offended and saying, well, make sure we don't lose inheritance of the land. We want it to stay within the tribe. It's a complete turnaround from one generation ago. One generation ago, the people didn't want to go into Israel. And now everybody's fighting for a land of, for, for portion in the land of Israel. Says the Tzor Hamor. What is, this, what is this telling you? It's telling you, we're concluding the book in a positive note, that the mistakes of the parents were not passed on to the children and the, Jew, and the children fall into the same patterns of behavior. To the contrary, these are the commandments that God tells Moshe to the children of Israel as they stood by our vote Moab as guarantors for their fathers, as guarantors for the parents. The children correct the mistake of the parents. And that's the big idea of the Torah, that we're not trapped in the mistakes of the past. Just we don't have to, we don't have to suffer from intergenerational trauma. We have the ability to correct the mistake of the parents. And by doing so, we also bring peace to their souls because we're correcting the mistakes of the past. And if you read it this way, then we're concluding the Torah in a very optimistic note, because otherwise, you, especially this book, the book of the fourth book is a book of failure. People leave Egypt, they're leaving away from Sinai in the beginning, everything looks optimistic. And the second they step away from Sinai, everything spirals out of control, culminating in the idea of the rejection of the land of Israel and the, pro and, and, and the decree that they, will be and the, the, that they will not be allowed into Israel. So it's a very depressing book. So the last verse says, don't worry. In the big scope of history, children will correct the mistake of the fathers, elevate the mistake of the fathers, and ultimately come to the other meaning of our, our, our votes, planes. It means planes, it means guarantor. It also means sweetness. It also means interconnected. It's a fascinating word. We discussed it sometime in the past, but I think that this is a beautiful end for the book because it ends in, a, in an optimistic note. The people who sinned, it's not the end of the story for them. The people who died in the desert, it's not the end of the story for them because their children have the power to correct. If they learn from the mistake and they correct, correct the mistake, they actually elevate and bring peace to the souls of their, of their, of their forebearers. So may we be strengthened. May we always remember that it's in our hands to correct not only the present and the future, but by doing so, we also correct the past. And we bring tikkun, we bring correction to all of history. So thank you all for joining. This has been a lot of fun for me, and I appreciate your joining.